All right, there's also something else called a quasi-mode. By the way, this makes another fabulous exam question. There's some researchers, Selen, Kurtenbach, and Buxton, and they show that holding down a key or pressing a foot pedal or some other form of physically holding an interface in certain states does not induce mode errors, such as having to hold down the control key. So these temporary modes are often referred to as quasi-modes or spring-loaded modes or spring-locked modes. That is basically a mode in which one must activate and hold a control while performing another action. These are also temporary modes. They are controlled by the user. Now quasi-modes can be really great when it comes to eliminating modes or eliminating permanent modes. Right? It can make things a lot faster and more efficient for your users. So a lot of people will recommend that you do use quasi-modes when you can. But are there any potential drawbacks to using a lot of quasi-modes? Can you think of any? Memorizing all the different keys. Memorizing all those different keys and commands. Right? So we are not going to memorize 20 different keys and commands for one program. We just aren't going to do it. So you need to remember that we are going to limit the number of quasi-modes, in other words, when we're using controls, when we are using a product. And as you are adding the number of other gestures, other keys that you need to depress, you are increasing the memory burden in addition to that. So what is control S in general? Save. Save. You want to do a spell check. Do you think you should do control SP? <coughs> Probably not. Right? So, but you could just add add to it, right? Control SP, control HI for highlight. Control HIL for highlight long. No. So you do need to be careful with these. Now there's also adaptive menus or adaptive palettes. This is basically where you're using a program such as Photoshop, right, or Photoshop Elements, and you have your palette pop up, and the most commonly used item or the one that you last used is now at the top, so it's easier. You don't have to move your mouse as much. What do you think? Good idea or bad idea? Could be a good idea, except what's wrong with that? What is it, what is it breaking? Default. Not just the default, starts with a C. Consistency. Sometimes we have these things memorized where it's nice that it's not right at the top, but in early versions of this, they actually would move that menu up. So now the menu is different every time the user would go to that adaptive menu. So what do they do now? Does anyone know? After they discovered their error. Typically what they'll do is the menu stays exactly the same. And they will simply have an additional potential command at the very top, the last thing that you used. So that the user has the option to use either one. They actually found that that significantly increased usability. Because by just moving it, in that case, more cognitive time was required to, to find it and figure out where it was because it was no longer consistent. So, as with other modes, there are best practices with quasi-modes. They should be reserved for control functions. And even then, you want to limit the number of control functions. Now, this is a really, really interesting aspect of commands that people tend not to think about. All right, when we look at a lot of commands, they involve applying a verb to a noun. So when we are trying to use a control, a control function, what should appear first, the verb or the noun? 
And let me give you an example. So let's say you want to change a font. Should you be able to select change font and then select the text? Or should you select the text and then change the font? Most people will want to select the text and then change the font, right? Which is nice. Do we always want to, want to do it that way? Not necessarily. Think about our highlight, right, where we have both options, where you could highlight it and click the highlight, or you can use that mode to permanently select the highlight and highlight things as if you're using a pen. So you need to think very, very carefully about who your users are and what they're used to doing. Now, of course, we still want to remember things like visibility and affordance, right? A visible interface feature. It's either accessible to a human sense organ or has not yet left short-term memory. At this point in the semester, people tend to kind of forget about it, right? Because it was at the beginning of the semester we talked about it. But we need to remember this particularly when it comes to modes. We need to be able to make our mode and the mode that we're in very, very visible. So you want to be able to indicate the mapping between an intended action and an actual operation by making it visible, by giving it affordance. Because if you have to memorize it, is it visible? No, then it's invisible. Now, a lot of times in most, you know, most products that you find in industry, there aren't that many interfaces that have these invisible features. But it just so happens that in a lot of games, we do have invisible features, right? Where if you want to figure out how to do something, you go do a Google search, and now they tell you of this invisible command, right? For games, I would say that's pretty typical. Anyone disagree with me? You disagree. Right? I get a new game, I always go, hmm, what new, new exciting hidden things can I find? Google. Now, may work fine for games. How, do you think, how well do you think that would work for an enterprise system, such as a database? Not so good. Yet people will still sometimes have put those in there. I'll give you an example. Now, this was many, many years ago where I was working on a product where it was a, a uh, object-oriented database that was being developed. And it just so happened that I was very good friends with the developers who were actually developing the database engine, which was not very well documented. And so people would have all these problems with be being able to get things to work, so they'd shoot me an email and I would look so brilliant because I would always have the answer. How do you think I always had the answer? Do I think I did I memorize all the invis, invisible uh, commands? Yeah, no. I sent an email to my friends who were the developers, and then they told me what the invisible command was. Now, made me look brilliant. But how well did that work for most users? Yeah, not so much. Now, of course, in this particular situation, it was a system that was under development. So eventually those issues were fixed, but imagine if that was actually put into a production system. That can be really, really problematic. So again, you need to emphasize that it needs to be visible to the user. Remember that affordances provide us with strong clues. Whether something has affordance depends on the user's background and their experience. So for us, we look at a doorknob and it's a lever. We're used to them. We don't think about it, right? We just turn it and, and, and push or turn it and pull. Do you think someone who has lived in the middle of the Amazon forest who has never seen modern technology would immediately know what to do with it? Probably not. So when you are designing things, you need to think about and ask how a user knows that an action is possible. Think about who your users are. You want to require that each visible feature provides recognizable affordance whenever possible. 
things such as icons, and make sure your icons make sense. Did I show you this earlier in the semester, the Bay Area Transit? No? All right, so this is BART. Do you guys know what BART is? It's the Bay Area Rapid Transit. This isn't San Francisco. Right, so this is basically their, their trains. That, uh, I don't know if, you've, if you guys read the news a couple weeks ago, they were having strikes, and it was on national news about how no one can get to work and all that fun and exciting stuff. No? Okay, I guess I'm on the only one. Well, anyway, for those of you who may have read, this is, this, was, this is actually their old system. So if we take a look at it, and you look at how, see how this interface was designed, they actually used modes in this interface. But if you kind of look at the steps, you kind of go up here. The first thing you have to do is select a ticket type. What do you think that does? It changes your mode. So the first thing the user is doing is, they, is, is that they are changing their mode. Then they are selecting a payment type. What do you think that does? It's another mode change. Then three. Uh, let's see, I can't, remember what, I can't remember what three is. But anyway, oh wait, sorry, there's three A, three, three A, three B, and three C. Depending on well, which one you use depends on the mode that you're in. Now, is it really obvious from this interface, even though it's not the best view, is it obvious from this interface which mode you would need to use? Which command you would need to use? No, it's not. Now, in addition to that, there's also issues with the terminology that was used. In this case, if you over okay, so if you overpay for a ticket, what do you get? What do you get back? Not, hopefully not nothing. Hopefully you get change, right? You know what this system called it? Correction. Yeah, I know. Where'd that come from? All right, so in this case, you don't have a good flow, you have constantly changing modes, makes it very difficult for the user. That's what you don't.